someone share a story with you from yesterday. Yesterday was my grandson's sixth birthday. So we went to a birthday party in, in Delaware. And, you know, have you ever been to a birthday party where the kids are just bouncing off the walls? <laughs> right? You can kind of relate to that, right? Have any of you been to the place called Urban Air? So, I heard some, some people have heard of it. Yeah, so this birthday party was at this place called Urban Air. And if you don't know what it is, it's a place, it's an indoor play area with trampolines, zip lines, uh, the, like the game Wipeout and American Ninja Warrior and Giant Slides. So at this party, they were literally bouncing off the walls because that's where all the trampolines were. It was just insane. I went up to the quiet room and just watched over and then the chaos happened. But now, you may not agree with me on this, but I think in general that most people have very high opinion of themselves. I felt that usually I've always had a pretty good idea where I stand in most situations as far as compared to other people. And I have friends that I've always felt were a little delusional when it came to uh, our talents against other people and stuff. Um, I remember we were playing in a rec league um, and our, our basketball team, we took second place in our league, which qualified us for the playoffs. And, all right, and in the playoffs, and when they did the brackets, second place team played first place team from another league. So in our first playoff game, we're playing the first place team from another league. And um, they beat us, and I honestly don't think they were worried about losing to us at any point in that game. They did enough to stay about 10 points ahead. Anytime we got closer, they threw it to their big guy. He scored any time he wanted. They get the lead back up to 15. They let us get back in within 10. They throw it to the big guy. So the whole way through the game, I don't think they were sweating it at all. So we're driving home. You know, and again, I think they get by 10 points. And I hear my friends in a car. You know, we drove down together. We got four of us in a car. And they're starting to talk about how we could have won that game. And I keep hearing them say, we could have done this. We could have done that. And finally, I got sick of them. I said, dudes, can you not accept that they were better than we were? I said, they could have beat us as bad as they wanted. They were just nice enough to beat us by 10 points. And I just think, um, again, they were a little delusional with the idea that we could have beat, beaten this team. Now, I've had uh, people I've competed against in sports. I've been, I've been a decent runner, but I trained with a guy in Hawaii who was so much better than me. I knew I could never beat him. Any of you have ever been in a situation like that where you know you can never beat somebody, right? They're always the people you should practice with because they're going to make you better. And finally, I beat this guy once. That's when I realized something about him I did not know. We were running a race. There's a 5K and a 10K. The 5K course was marked in red. The 10K course was marked in blue. We were both running the 10K. And I beat him by a lot. And I was like, dude, what was wrong? He goes, I got lost. I said, how could you get lost? The course was red and blue. He goes, that's my fat out. Guess what? He's colorblind. <laughs> he ran all over the place. <laughs> he came in dog tired. I mean, this is a guy that was running 10K in just under 30 minutes. It's like 50 minutes later, he still hadn't finished. I'm like, so early on. And I couldn't tell anybody he was colorblind because where we work, you had to know the different colors of the wires. So, uh, yeah, it was something he was, and I didn't know until he got lost that he could tell the difference. But, but how many of us are comfortable admitting that someone is better than us? That someone may be more important than us. Someone may be greater than us. We're going to continue to look at someone who was very comfortable about who he was, and what he was supposed to accomplish. We're going to look at John chapter 1, verses 19, verses 19 through 28. John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28. And if you were here last week, you're going to see that this sounds very familiar. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess, confess freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thought of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptized. Now last week we looked at the significance of John as it was mentioned in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And we talked about how Mark started talking about John the Baptist and had, how Mark was speaking to the Christians in Rome or a Gentile audience. And we mentioned that in Rome, they expect that if someone great is coming, that there should be someone announcing their presence, someone who is a herald saying, hear ye, hear ye, hear someone who is going to be coming. And, and so Mark made a point of emphasizing that John the Baptist was this herald who was to come. Now today we look at a passage at the start of the Gospel of John. And we once again see the significance of John the Baptist. Now we need to understand, I always mention this, but it's, it's always worth repeating. Anytime you look at the Gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are the synoptic Gospels. They are basically telling a lot of the same stories, just different viewpoints from a historian, a poet, and a doctor. But here, in the Gospel of John, we need to understand that <coughs> when they asked John to write his time, about his time with Jesus, he said, you already have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They said, but you're the last one. You know, give us your information. Tell us. Make sure it gets written down. So what John decided to do was 75% to 80% of the Gospel of John is unique to John. So he wanted to fill in the stuff that other people didn't mention. So anytime he mentions something another time, is to tell you the importance that he feels this still needs to be announced or mentioned a fourth time. So here you have John mentioning about John the Baptist. So the apostle, the disciple of John, is definitely telling you that this is something that is significant and needs to be heard and needs to be understood. So last week when we mentioned John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, we related it a little bit about the whole preparation that we do for the Christmas season. We talk about everything that we do. We talk about decorating. We talk about right, wrapping gifts, making plans for family and all that. It's all part of the preparation for Christmas that we do. Then we look, even for the birth of Jesus, there was all this preparation done. We talked about the time frame of Rome and the empire. The, the empire. We talked about uh, the Jews waiting for the next prophet, that the time was all prepped for this significant event. But we want to look today that no matter how important John the Baptist was, he truly understood his place and who was actually more important than he was. In this passage, we see John being confronted by the religious leaders in Jerusalem. It mentions the priests, the Levites in the, in, at the start, and later it mentions some of the Pharisees. Again, this talks about the audience. Why wasn't this mentioned when uh, Mark was writing about this to the Christians in Rome? The Gentiles would have cared less that the religious leaders from <coughs> Jerusalem would have went out to question John. So this is telling you that this audience is probably a Jewish audience because this is something significant to them. This is something to make you understand that this is important and the readers or the hearers would understand the significance of the Levites and the, the priests and the Pharisees going out to see John the Baptist. Now, these leaders had their purposes, and it's interesting how they um, decide to approach John the Baptist. Now, it must be understood that the priests and the Levites were very well-respected leaders in Jerusalem, and we know the Pharisees were often denounced by John the Baptist and also by Jesus, but also they held high positions in Jerusalem, and they were respected by the people. Now, these religious leaders, they're going out there to question John for multiple reasons. One, it was their duty as protectors of the faith to look into any new preachings that's coming along. So it was part of what they were doing to protect the people, was to go out and question this individual. They also wanted to know if John had the credentials to be a prophet. Again, they had been waiting for a prophet for about 400 years. There hasn't been one since Malachi. 
Gladly, John was getting quite a following. There were people that were following John, and they were probably a little jealous and wanted to see what he got, what he had going on. So that's another reason why they were going out. In the Pharisees' minds, there were only a couple of explanations of who John the Baptist could be. Again, they've been waiting for a prophet for 400 years, so could this be the next prophet um, that could have been foretold by Moses? And they wanted to see if that's who it was. They thought he also could have been Elijah, or maybe the Messiah. So it was up to them to evaluate the test and also find out, is this guy really, he could be a false prophet. So they want to go and question and test him, again, protecting the people so they don't get led astray. So that was the mindset of the Pharisees as they questioned John. And John was very clear in all of his responses. He knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly what his importance was and what his purpose was. He says he's not the Christ, and he says he's not Elijah. Then instead he reemphasizes that he's the voice calling the desert, preparing the people for the Lord. Again, the Jewish hearers or readers would know this is a reference to Isaiah, just like Mark referred to Isaiah in um, the beginning of his gospel. So they would all know what this is talking about when he quoted that. And then John is baptizing uh, the Jews with water for repentance. And normally, in this time, only the Gentiles would be the ones who would get baptized as they were converting to Judaism. So this is, again, something totally new that the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to question him about. And that's what John says. It's a symbol. That this baptism is a symbol of repentance. And it's preparing for Christ, who will then come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. So the religious leaders are testing. They're checking out everything that John the Baptist says and everything that he's pointing out. And this... And they're trying to determine that John, when John says that he's not even worthy to be a slave for the coming Messiah. So when we think about this, John the Baptist has a growing of followers. So he's got a crowd behind him. He's teaching and preaching with great knowledge. So he knows his stuff. And, one of the, and he's obviously one worthy enough that the religious leaders felt that they needed to go out to travel and see him out by the Jordan. And then he's making sure that even though John knows all this is happening and the religious leaders are paying him respect by coming out, he's making sure to tell all of them how much greater the Messiah who is coming is compared to him. He wants them all to know. He can go, hey, you're giving me this respect. i got a following of people. I'm preaching and teaching, but there's one so much greater coming and John even mentions that the Messiah is now among them. And they do not even know who he is. And to me, this last statement is so important when we talk about Christmas and the preparation for the holiday season. We know how important John the Baptist was in preparing the way before the Lord, yet he knows how much greater Jesus is. But in today's world, where so many people have such a high opinion of themselves, they can't even comprehend someone who is so much greater than themselves. John pointed out to the Pharisees that the Messiah was among them, and they do not even know him. How many people in our world do not know that the Lord is among them? When we talk about the celebration of the birth of Jesus, what is holding people back from knowing the Messiah today. Could it be that this celebration has become a season of sales and marketing, retail stores, massive shopping lists, and shiny wrapping paper? Shiny wrapping paper. Could we be missing the Messiah because of the stresses of family gatherings and relatives in town and trying to figure out where everyone is going to sleep and eat? The Pharisees didn't know the Messiah that was already among them. Has our world been too distracted to notice Jesus too? As we continue to celebrate the Advent season, we need to understand how much preparation was put in place for the arrival of the birth of Jesus and the start of his ministry. When we take the time to celebrate the birth of our Savior this year, 
I thought it would be good to relook at all the preparation that we've done, and then also look at all the preparation that's been done for the arrival of Jesus through John the Baptist. All that preparation for the birth of the Messiah. We may, and may we not think of ourselves so highly that we forget the one who is so much greater, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue to look at the preparation for the birth of Jesus, and we talked about John the Baptist for uh, two weeks so far, and we talked about the time frame and, and the, the preparation and why Jesus was born the time he was, and the significance. And here now we looked at the announcement of John the Baptist to uh, the Jews in Jerusalem. Last week we looked at the uh, importance of John the Baptist to the Gentiles in Rome. And we will continue to look at all this preparation because we need to understand that maybe when we are decorating a tree and we're doing preparation for the holidays, maybe we can take that as a reminder of all the preparation that was done prior to the birth of Jesus. And as you are gathering with family and friends during this holiday season, may we take that as an opportunity for those who may have questions, those who may be seeking, that we know the information that we can share, that they can hear about the birth of Jesus and the Messiah, and that he is still with us today. There is many in our world who have no idea what the celebration of this season is about. And it's our job to teach and tell them. Lord, we ask that you give us the strength that we can be your witnesses. In your powerful and precious name. <clears throat>